One of the things I miss most during this whole pandemic is sitting down with people, loved ones, friends, family members, even strangers in a restaurant at community tables to eat. It has always been a sacred act for me. What is it about sharing food that makes such an impact on us? Even the cooking and the preparation of a meal becomes sacred and offering. There are a number of movies out that depict this very concept, such as Babette's Feast, like Water for Chocolate, Ratatouille, Big Night, Julie and Julia, and Tampopo. A number of years ago, I read a book by Sarah Miles called Take This Bread. She talks about her conversion to Christianity, which she finds when she enters an Episcopalian church on a whim one Sunday morning in San Francisco to find a strange rit ritual called communion. The ritual of taking communion, eating bread and drinking the wine takes her breath away, shatters her understanding of what Christianity is all about, and she comes back for more. She had been a journalist in war-torn Central America and in Africa, and she explains. Just like strangers who'd fed me in El Salvador or South Africa, I was going to have to see and understand the hunger of other different men and women and make a gesture of welcome and eat with them. And just as I hadn't deserved any of what was being given to me, the fish, the biscuits, the tea so abundantly poured out back in those years, I didn't deserve communion myself now. I wasn't getting it because I was good. I wasn't getting it because I was special. I certainly didn't get to pick who else was good enough, holy enough, deserving enough to receive it. It wasn't a private meal. The bread on the table had to be shared with everyone in order for me to really taste it. She goes on to explain her initiation into Christianity and how difficult it was for her having grown up with non-religious parents. And yet, in that journey, she is asked to help distribute communion one Sunday, and she says this. What happened once I started distributing communion was the truly disturbing, dreadful realization about Christianity. You can't be a Christian by yourself. You know, that's one of the most difficult parts about being isolated from one another right now. Yes, we can worship alone. Yes, we can continue to grow in our faith and learn something new or deeper about our connection with God. But Christianity itself was meant to be a community faith. We just have to figure it out. How to respectfully and carefully honor one another for those who could be at risk. And how to find increasingly safe ways of being together. There have been way too many examples of churches and groups that have gathered spreading the virus among their members unknown, unknown until someone or many someones got seriously ill. We just need to use the imagination and creativity that God has given us to figure it out. And we will. Maybe this is a time for us to reset, to appreciate all of what we have been, what we've taken for granted and to figure out what is most important. Until then, we can use whatever technology we have at our disposal to continue doing worship and community this way. A couple of years ago, several restaurants began offering the option of community tables, long tables set for crowds of people that didn't necessarily know one another. In my town of Swickley, Mediterra, one of my favorite restaurants, has two of them. But even places like First Watch have begun introducing them. Here, strangers may sit across from one another or next to one another and eat together. Well, one Saturday morning, we went to Matera, Mediterra for breakfast. Honestly, I had had a terrible week and wasn't in the mood for socializing with anyone, much less strangers. But most of the private tables were occupied, so we reluctantly sat down at the community table. Of course, shortly after, an elderly couple sat down across from us. I stared at my cup of coffee and ate quietly, looking only between my fork and the food I was putting on it. Ultimately, someone broke the silence and offered a non-committal comment question. Oh, their food is so good, isn't it? Sighing, I responded. 
We spoke lightly about the food at Mediterra, how much we enjoyed the new place, and then slowly, opening me up, we began talking about other subjects. I learned that the older gentleman had been an investment banker and had lived in England, Spain, and Germany for most of his life. She was from Spain where they had met and married. In his retirement, he was now a partial owner of another restaurant on the south side. We talked about how different Christianity is practiced in other parts of the world, particularly in Europe. They gave me lots of tips of places to visit the next time I'm in Europe. On a day I wanted to sit in silence, appreciate a meal. Others perhaps saw in me the need to talk and listen, and maybe they needed that too. We met as strangers, parted as friends over a shared meal. Sarah Miles in her book says, all of it pointed to a force stronger than the anxious formulas of religion, a radically inclusive love that accompanied people in the most ordinary of actions, eating, drinking, walking, and stayed with them through fear, even past death. That love meant giving yourself away embracing outsiders as family, emptying yourself to feed and live for others. The stories illuminated the holiness located in mortal human bodies and the promise that people could see God by cherishing all those different bodies the way God did. They spoke of a communion so much vaster than any church can contain, one I had sensed all my life, could be expressed in the sharing of food particularly with strangers. You know, it was fine to sit across the table with people who were like me, who had lived and traveled to other parts of the world, who had a thorough grasp of life apart from themselves. But what about people who are very different from me, from you? Sarah Miles goes on. What I heard and continue to hear is a voice that can crack religious and political convictions open that advocates for the least qualified, the least official, the least likely, that upsets the established order and makes a joke of certainty. It proclaims against reason that the hungry will be fed, that those cast down will be raised up, and that all things, including my own failures, are being made new. It offers food without exception to the worthy and the unworthy, the screwed up and pious, and then commands everyone to do the same. It doesn't promise to solve or erase suffering, but to transform it, pledging that by loving one another, even through pain, we will find more life. And it insists that by opening ourselves to strangers. Yes, this couple sitting across from me had a similar life experience to my own. We were relatively in the same socioeconomic bracket. But sitting there, I imagined a whole cast of characters, some having spent years in investment banking, others having rarely a dime to their name, all of us sitting at the table sharing story, eating bread, drinking coffee. Just because someone has wealth or prestige or is in a particular socioeconomic bracket doesn't mean that they aren't broken. We sometimes falsely believe that only the poor are outcasts, that only the less fortunate are weak. But as Julia Roberts' character says in Pretty Woman, that's just real estate. The condition of the soul and spirit knows no such boundaries. Miles says, I understand why Christians imagined the kingdom of heaven as a feast, a banquet where nobody was excluded where the weakest and most broken, the most, the worst sinners and the outcasts were honored guests who welcomed one another in peace and shared their food. Finally, she says, there's a hunger beyond food that's expressed in food. And that's why feeding is always a kind of miracle. Today's New Testament story from the Gospel of Matthew is about feeding of the multitudes. And that feeding is recorded in all, in all of the Gospels, including in John, which is rare among them. Often Matthew, Mark, and Luke, known as the Synoptic Gospels, tell similar parallel stories. Or there is a common story between one of those Gospels and John, 
but rarely do all four Gospels have the very same story. In the Synoptic Gospels, it is inferred within the story that these loaves of bread and two fish are what the disciples had themselves to eat. And Jesus wanted them to not keep it for themselves, but to give them to the crowd of thousands. Now, the one big difference in John's Gospel is that these five loaves of bread and two fish that the disciples had weren't from their own provisions, but instead were given to them by a boy in the crowd. It is a significant departure from the story that the other gospel accounts tell, but one that fits the gospel of John well, because John was the quintessential storyteller. If you think back on your life in or even outside the church, what ministers or church leaders do you remember? Who had an impact on you? I remember growing up in the Downingtown Westchester area with pastors, Wayne Allen, Dick Whiteside, Bob Lamont, Linda J. Berg, and Bill Haas. Each of them helped shape me in different ways as I grew in my faith. But I also remember some additional members of the church or the church staff. Glenn Kinkner, our church organist. Robin Friends, our choir director. Dow Matthews, an elder of the church and my confirmation Sunday school class teacher. And many others whose lives touched my own in different ways. They became important to me because of what they did, what they said, and more importantly, how they related to others. All of them were personable, approachable, and took whatever I offered as a young child or as a younger youth as gift. Whether that was a prayer during Children's Sunday or my voice in choir or a question about something in the Bible, each took those offerings as a worthy offering and sacred. And that made an impression on me. The boy looked upon the crowd and couldn't imagine what good his small lunch could offer them. The, the disciple said to Christ, all we have are five loaves of bread and two fish. What good could this be for so many? We think about the amount of poverty the lack of food, water, shelter in the world. We think of the poverty of the soul and those who walk, travel, work, and live among us. What good will our small offering be? Our gift of money or time or presence is only a drop in a bucket when you consider the immensity of the need. But it means the world to the one person that receives it. Whether that's an actual meal or a friendly smile or a listening ear, to brighten someone's day. What small gift do you have to offer as worthy, as sacred, as sacrifice? As the anthem asked, what is your five loaves and two fish? In a conversation Sarah has with her friend Steve, the point of church is to, isn't to get people to come to church. No, said Steve, cocky an eyebrow. What is it? It seemed obvious to me to feed them so they can go out, you know, be Jesus. Thanks be to God. Amen.